Hi, everyone. So I think we're back. Uh, hopefully, we're here. I think Vlad has sent out the um, uh, a new link for us uh, to this as well. Let me make sure first that the audio is OK. So if you could let me know in the comments uh, whether that's the, the fact. If you can hear me or not, please let me know. All good. All right, excellent. Thanks, everyone. Um, so Vlad's just sent out the new link. Uh, I see we're gaining more people of a second. Excellent, Lenny. Thank you very much. Um, excellent. Good. Works there. Uh, so <clears throat> I will, let's wait a couple seconds for everyone to sort of move over. Um, <clears throat> and then we'll begin. Uh, we're holding steady the number. Okay. So what I was talking about was the the five month program is is comprised then of the the thirty researchers. Um, the thirty researchers uh, are drawn from uh, a quite diverse disciplinary and geographic background. Uh, generally, we like to we even though this is a uh, urban design postgraduate program. Uh, half of the participants in the program uh, have no formal uh, architecture or urbanism background. They come from other disciplines. They're traditionally have been artists, filmmakers, um, writers, philosophers, um, actual nuclear physicists, um, coders, programmers, game designers, uh, you name it. And, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the rationale for that um, is that we want to have um, uh, quite interdisciplinary forms of a kind of urban design practice um, that we are able to uh, uh, develop. So instead of only having um, architects and urbanists, which is obviously a, a very important sort of discourse and history of understanding what constitutes the city and how it might be recomposed and redesigned, um, the larger question of urbanism and what cities are, what cities should be, uh, allows for multiple entry points uh, that different disciplinary diff differences and different perspectives can develop. So in short, one way in which we'd like to think about it is that the real um, sort of deliverable of the program uh, are a new kind of urban design practice, uh, ones that are more interdisciplinary, uh, ones that start from a premise that um, uh, what software as software comes to take on more of the role that we use society used to ask of architecture that is the organization of bodies and 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 things moving in space and time uh, that the question of software design to meet it's already one that is uh, not true not cannot fully be disconnected from uh, its urban context uh, and the construct and the development correspondingly the design of an urban context is one that not necessarily has software embedded in it, but programmatically will be needs to be responsive to digital systems as we use to navigate them around as well. So all of which is to say is that we very <clears throat> very much welcome applicants from uh, different dis different disciplines. The, the the research program that we put together for this year um, around the terraforming, I think is probably in many ways even more interdisciplinarily uh, interdisciplinarily focused than um, even the new normal one uh, one was. Um, I think for, for obvious reasons uh, regarding the, the, what we might call the unnegotiable reality of our uh, e uh, ecological circumstance, uh, the predicament uh, that is called the Anthropocene by some other names um, uh, by others, um, represents uh, a, a unique, uh, or at least not so unique, but in many ways, I think an unprecedented challenge to um, not only uh, design, uh, but even a, perhaps on a more fundamental level to um, to philosophy and to the questions of the relationships between uh, uh, culture and the and the material world, and the materiality, the really sort of again the kind of unnegotiable physics and indeed chemistry of uh, ec ecological circumstance, 
is is in, uh, of course a, a, a topic and area of of expertise from natural sciences, biological sciences. Um, we will be in, incorporating uh, many of those uh, sort of researchers and participants, and indeed faculty, in, into the program. Um, it's one that challenges uh, for fundamental kinds of geo uh, notions of of geopolitics, of what really of what governmentality and what governance really entails. Um, so all of us should say that interdisciplinarity is 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 essential for us. So um, as mentioned, what I'd like to do is to sort of give a little bit of a summary of that, uh, of a little bit what we're doing in the program. There is a, a video that is a, uh, a longer introduction to the whole program um, that we did um, uh, a little bit earlier in the summer. And I'll post the link for that here um, so that you can, you can look at that. That was about an hour and a half long introduction to the entire program. So if you're looking for more of a deep dive, into the work that we'll be doing and kind of an, ex an explication of that, um, that'll be a good place to look. And again, I'll, I'll post that link here in, in the comments for you in a second. There's also a book um, that I've written um, over the summer called The Terraforming, uh, which is much shorter than the stack. Um, it's about 35, 30,000 words. Um, it's now available. Um, if you're in Russia, it's available. The print version is, is available um, through Stroka Press. Um, everywhere else, the Amazon and all the regular um, formal and informal channels. Um, the the digital version is now available as well. So that would be kind of the long version of the research project. We have this as well, and so I'll post those links there shortly if you want to follow up um, on this on this as well. Um, I want to then talk a little bit about the uh, some of the the key ideas that we are developing um, for the program, um, and in the lecture. I, I broke these down into what we call, and in the book, the 11 assumptions. Um, those are, and I'll sort of very quickly go through each of those as a way of starting, of starting through this. And here is the link for, oh great, now it won't let me post. Not very good day for the Google YouTube studio system. All right. I'll ask Vlad to post those as well for us because I'm not even able to post into here as well. So fantastic. Um, all right, so the 11 assumptions uh, that we're looking at, one has to do with an understanding of the planet itself as a sentient uh, structure. The issues of geologic sensing, geographic sensing um, uh, are, are, are paramount to this as well. One way in which we try to begin to try to think about this is less as, as if there were a a kind of natural world um, that was existed so that sort of pre-technosphere, uh, pre-human, uh, that on top of which there has been this synthetic or this organization of a synthetic or uh, layer of, of of sensing and calculative infrastructure, but rather thinking of this calculative, this sensing and calculative infrastructure, which would include everything up to satellite systems and and the rest of this as in fact part of a very, very long-term process by which um, the, uh, by which uh, the earth sort of begins to, if you like, fold itself in such a way that it becomes capable of producing more uh, knowledge about itself, about its environment and around its, 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 external, um, its external conditions. Um, we are a mediating process uh, with, within this, um, but we are uh, not necessarily the uh, executive agent of it uh, always in ways in which we, we we think about it and so the question of uh, planetarity more broadly is one that we're interested in discussing in relation to this this question of a kind of planetary um, planetary sentience if you, if you like um, corresponding to that which was the second point is the idea that when we ask the very sensible question of what is the role of planetary scale computation in the mitigation of climate change or climate collapse? Um, this question needs to be asked <clears throat> in the context of the fact that the very concept of climate change uh, is a is is a is derived from uh, the statistical models of uh, that are aggregated through a planetary scale computational um, sensing. Cal um, calculation um, and uh, uh, information processing infrastructure. If you like, um, 
without planetary scale computation, com climate change may exist, but the concept of climate change as a statistical regularity, as a model, doesn't emerge. And so um, we need to, I, I think, be attentive to this as a particular path for the, the question of what is planetary scale computation for? What are we using it for? Um, how can it contribute to the production of models of the planet that are not only descriptive, but also work in ways that are able to act back upon the ecological forces that it's modeling in ways that uh, can govern those forces and, and, trend, and, and steer them, if you like, um, away from precipices of collapse. How indeed ecological science can become a more a strong fo uh, force within what we take to be the, the political structure more, more generally. Um, towards that, uh, we the, the idea of point number three um, is thinking about the large questions of automation. We have a kind of idiosyncratic notion of automation as implying not only uh, machines replacing things that humans used to do, um, but rather as a, as a, if you like, as a kind of combined biological and technical semiotics um, formation, uh, unfolding and uh, development. Um, and integrate that, that the integration of carbon-based and non-carbon-based relays uh, is fundamental to the way any ecology works, whether that ecology is inside a factory or inside a forest. And that one way to think about automation in particularly is ways in which those relay systems are able to um, specify and abstract a particular process and to repeat uh, that process in its abstracted mode in such a way that the deliberation and decision necessary to come to determine whether or not that process is going to work doesn't need to be, uh, doesn't need to be, uh, doesn't need to be made anymore. It's a kind of automation of decision, uh, if you like. And then that physically gets built into, um, gets built into the relay itself, whether that's living or non-living. And so, this more expanded notion of automation is something that we'll be exploring a bit more. Obviously, it draws on um, uh, everything from you know, Wiener cybernetics, Simon Don's um, uh, kinds of techno uh, technogenesis, um, but also quite a bit from uh, uh, the, the overlap of, of uh, 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 complex adaptive systems theory and ecological science, which is obviously a, an area of some of some interest. Um, and then four, which is an issue which I've already spoken to, again, is this automation is a general principle by which uh, ecosystems work. We define automation not as a kind of synthetic transference of natural human agency into technical systems, but as the condition by which action and abstraction are codified into these adaptive relays through living bodies and non-adaptive media. And in this, um, the next point is that we need to be thinking about climate change mitigation and automation as a kind of converged uh, problem space, uh, that in, in many ways that there isn't any way in which um, we are going to achieve necessary economies of scale and resource um, efficiencies, uh, regardless of, of, of how many how much it, uh, uh, um, um, it is used, um, without processes by which um, these forms of decision abstraction are uh, are synthesized and built into those systems those systems of, of relays. Um, at, 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 an infra, at an infrastructural scale. And in many ways, the question of climate change may be inside the question of automation, the question of automation inside the question of, 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 of climate change, uh, climate change more broadly. Um, the next point uh, that we, we are looking at this, this um, the, the space or question of, of, of a geo design or a geo engineering in a um, again, a, a somewhat more uh, idiosyncratic use of the term. Our, our interest in geoengineering is not just, not simply sort of strange new schemes for cloud seeding or changing ocean response and albedo and, 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 and all the rest of this kind of stuff, um, but rather first and foremost of understanding geoengineering not as, a, as, 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 not as just as a type of technology, but ultimately as a, a scale of design uh, a design effect. Um, so there's an interest in reappropriating and redefining this term um, in such a way that it refers to this kind of scale of design effect, which would include 
um, what we may think of more sort of passive forms of geoengineering, such as preventing already existing carbon sinks um, from being destroyed. And so it's a, it's a model of, of geodesign that's not framed as a kind of omniscient, reductive control of ecological mechanisms, but rather as a more, um, as a kind of uh, hyper-practical, uh, geotechnically minded and hopefully geopolitically um, uh, sensitive coming to grips with the anthropogenic uh, climate effects. And this would include issues of removal of uh, CO2 from existing atmosphere as well. Um, necessary fundamental shifts in geotechnology are likely to precede uh, fundamental shifts in geopolitics. It's a kind of uh, an understanding that the way that the cha transformations that we need in order to in this recomposition of planetary systems of which our cities are a part, not just on top of, um, that uh, the technical shifts may be the ones that in fact bring about the cultural and political shifts that we need, um, that our interest in the governance of, of living systems, of ecological system, carbon flows, energy flows, uh, may will, will likely come to take uh, more importance than the governance of the voice and will of individuated um, human actors, not that this isn't important, but rather that there is a, we, we, we see that part of the problem in the way in which planetary scale computation has been used is that it's focusing primarily on the construction of, of, of profiles of individual humans, whether those are for advertising purposes, for purposes of political prediction, for the prediction of behavior, um, the political context or advertising and, 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 and market context, whatever, um, that this individuation of the of the human as this basis of, of what planetary comes computation for um, it was the wrong path, was the wrong path. And one of the interesting things that we, one of the ways in which we want to explore um, <clears throat> ecological science um, as a way, as a, as, as the means by which comp planetary scale computation can produce models of the world that in turn can be used to govern that world itself um, has to do with shifting what it is that we are sensing, modeling, and producing information about itself. And that um, this, this, this is in essence a kind of another Copernican turn um, within computation away from the individuated human subject. So a lot of interest next in, in energy infrastructures, um, particularly ones that are will be based on long-term waste cycles um, and, and, and energy system uh, produces waste, and the ones that are are able to do so in ways that are actually more governable have an advantage in this as well. Um, there's an interest in the ways in which uh, this, I think, this understanding shifts some of the priorities and uh, uh, about what we identify as being um, the, the the validity and pursuit of, of, of cultural pursuits in and of themselves. Um, that the idea that culture, human culture, represents a kind of transcendental um, transcendental good in and of itself is something we're perhaps suspicious of we are we start from the, an understanding that part of the part of the recipe of the anthropocene is not just um and again i understand there's issues with this term but not part of the recipe of the anthropocene is not just that humans themselves have transformed the world but also that the idea that the world is here for the humans um is is what validates that proposition and indeed even that the that the experience of our experience of the world <clears throat> as a pursuit in and of itself is what provides for this um, provides for this uh, anth this anthropocentrism and there and by the by so the anthropocene um, and that the question of an alternative planetarity which is really in many ways what we're what we're looking at uh, a, a different way of of understanding how to properly occupy a planet. Uh, to live in a planet um, uh, and to indeed to if we understand if we understand the of evolution of human sapience as one of the means by which uh, in essence the planet comes to think and produce abstractions about itself our own our own thought processes are a kind in this say not only a biological phenomenon but indeed it is certainly even a geological phenomenon um, that the question of how it is that um, a planet comes to organize itself uh, in a way that may be, uh, uh, in fact, more 
more reasonable and more sustainable becomes the question of this environment planetarity. And so the question of how to seeing this from the outside, how to understand this process, not just as it appears to us, but understanding <clears throat> from the outside oftentimes involves seeing the planet itself from the outside. And so the, <clears throat> the lineage of uh, space exploration, uh, whether hum manned or unmanned, and particularly the unmanned versions may prove to be much more interesting, has been in ways that aren't mysterious, a, a deeply important uh, uh, and prof profoundly important means by which um, we have shifted from, for us, our experience shifted from the, the, the inhabitation of a, merely a world, um, a kind of natural intuitive horizon uh, with uh, anthropometric time and spatial scales into understanding ourselves as the uh, as creatures that occupy the surface of a planet and the shift from a kind of world to a planet in the configuration is something that the the the, the continued uh, sort of exploration of looking at ways in which that the, um, uh, the conceptualizations of of space have been continue to be important and so this is in more recent years there has been a kind of uh, uh, return of interest to questions of space um, in ways that it, the, the story kind of gone dark for a while. And I think the reason for this is because these questions of planetarity themselves um, are returning to the, the center of, of, of the questions of, of, of who we are, but also where should the cities go? And what should we be doing with them? And so this lineage is one that we're, we're continuing. Um, and then last point, uh, in terms of the kinds of design that we're interested in, we are, uh, it is a speculative design program. We are interested in the specification and articulation and representation of um, not just non-intuitive, but really actually counterintuitive possible paths for how that planetarity can uh, might, it might emerge, what it might look like, what it shouldn't look like. Um, and I suppose one way I think about this in terms of this, the kind of speculative design this represents is it's not about sort of starting with a blank page and doing whatever we can think about. It's rather really working with constraints that are um, so significant and so again unnegotiable uh, that all of the commonsensical ways in which business as usual would 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 seek to uh, respond to this circumstance immediately make no sense. Where the speculative design that we're interested in is to in, therefore, as we say, to focus on what is so deeply functional, deeply functional response to a circumstance that it appears wildly unlikely to happen. Um, and in doing so, what is likely to happen will um, perhaps by seem quite insane by comparison. Um, and so then let me very quickly go through some of the faculty that we'll have in the program, and then we'll open it up to questions. So the, the five months will begin with um, the week-long seminar with me, where I'll be uh, unpacking the, this terraforming initiative in considerable detail. Um, we'll be working with UC Perica, the Finnish, um, uh, the Finnish media theorist, author of Geology of Media, um, Helen Hester, the author of Xenofeminism, um, Nick Cernchek, uh, author of Platform Capitalism and Inventing the Future, uh, Kadwo Eshun, the British Ghanaian uh, writer, theorist, and, and, and filmmaker, Boris Groys, the Russian art historian will be coming back to Moscow to work uh, work with this as well. Um, a couple of remote faculty that we'll be bringing in, Holly Jean Buck, just published a book called After Geoengineering with Verso, extraordinarily interesting book, as well as Jeff Mena, uh, curator of the Building Blog, uh, blog and, and author of many uh, wonderful books. Uh, we'll have a, a whole series of, of, of Russian faculty uh, with, who have uh, some deep expertise in issues of uh, Russian uh, ecological systems relating to both from the from biology to the international um, the international geopolitical implications, um, legal implications, um, this relationship between, in many cases, the sociology and the ecology 
um, or the, and, and also the uh, philosophy and the astronomy, if you like. Um, We'll be doing a workshop with, as well, Det with Dennis Vantiev, who's the director of, of the of principal of the KB, which is um, a Moscow-based um, uh, urban design uh, uh, studio and, and consultancy. is doing a lot of um, quite interesting work all throughout Russia, and will be a basis for us to sort of ground our, our thinking within this Russian context. And again, I should say, I should go without saying, but the projects that we'll be developing will be using um, using Russia as kind of our our our, uh, our, our, our eleven time zone wide case study um, and site condition by which to think through some of these think through some of these issues. Um, Robert Patrushko from Harvard GSD, um, sort of the a, a quite amazing uh, 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 designer with data visualization, geographic uh, geographic visualization, uh, uh, as particularly landscape systems, um, design Earth. The architecture studio uh, based at um, uh, Ryan Goshen's at, at MIT, uh, Al Hadi Jazari uh, at University uh, of Michigan. Um, quite beautiful and, uh, and, and lovely uh, drawings and visualizations of what those forms of alternative planetarity might be. Um, we'll be working with Liam Young again um, from SciArc, formerly of AA, um, on, on the first of our. Uh, field trips. We take two field trips a year. I'll mention that one of them, the first, is, is within Russia, um, uh, which is usually a, a sort of uh, remote location. Uh, in this case, with this theme, we'll have several things to choose from. Um, it also works as a kind of, uh, is the first phase of the filmmaking boot camp. We're, a lot of the projects that we'll be doing at this time will be filmic based. You don't need to have a film background whatsoever to participate, um, but we will be. Uh, 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 working together to develop, so the, and part of this trip is also as a kind of footage gathering and processing uh, mission. Uh, Meta Haven uh, also will be back. The Dutch design, uh, I guess, in this place, also really at this point a kind of um, cinematic studio. Uh, uh, Meta Haven is background in graphic design, but has shifted into um, a really beautiful and extraordinary uh, experimental cinema practice. And so we'll be working with Meta Haven as well um, around the, these questions. Um, but not just sight, uh, also sound uh, as part of the, the interest that we will be developing and in, in, in particular around <clears throat> the questions of the uh, artificiality, if you like, of, of, of the forms of possible articulation. Holly Herndon and Matt Dryhurst uh, will be joining us. Holly and, and Matt just re recently released a, an album that was um, in collaboration, as they say, with an AI. Um, and so this question of the relationship of the, of the of both human and non-human forms of um, organic and inorganic intelligence um, collaborating, amalgamating into forms of um, uh, forms of uh, expression and expressivity that we wouldn't have been able to otherwise deduce um, will be will work there. We'll also be doing a, a kind of focus module sequence around, as I indicated, space and space exploration. Uh, space uh, conceptualization um, and so forth. And so we'll be working with uh, remotely this year with um, Kim Stanley Robinson, the California American science fiction writer, um, author of the obviously the Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars, um, Mars Terraforming Trilogy, and more recently uh, Red Moon. Uh, Lisa Masseri, uh, the author of Placing Outer Space. Uh, she's an anthropologist at Yale, quite extraordinary book on the ways in which uh, scientists who study exoplanets. We've discovered 2,000 something exoplanets, the planets outside of our solar system, roughly since the early 90s. Um, and the ways in which scientists conceptualize these spaces, these, these places as a kind of place, there is an anthropological construction there as well. Um, and this role of anthropology, not only as a descriptive, but indeed in this case as a kind of projective interest is, is important to us. Um, we're going to be going as well to, um, uh, also, and, last, and, and lastly, also with us joining us will be in, in Moscow will be Ellie During, who's the, the French philosopher of science. Um, you may know Ellie's work, particularly around philosophy of time, Bergson, Einstein, and others, but he's been working re much more um, intensely around issues of what he calls zero gravity philosophy and the, the absence of ground and the implications of this for um, uh, a kind of re, re understanding of uh, tr traditions within. Uh, continental philosophy, which are dependent in many ways, in ways that maybe even um, uh, 
deeply implicit uh, in um, uh, in the in the premise of a sort of grounded grounded horizon and what happens when this vanishes and indeed what happens when we realize that it probably was illusory here as well. We're, the second of our research trips is going to be to Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, where we will be in essence decamping the seminar and the studio and bringing it to uh, a new location, uh, in this case uh, in, in Cambridge, uh, where we'll be doing a number of laboratory visits, studio visits, um, uh, 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 and, and seminars with uh, uh, faculty uh, and programs uh, in and around the Cambridge area, which would include at Harvard and MIT. Uh, and we have a number of people lined up for this as well. It'll be a very sort of a, a super intense uh, week of, of visits uh, as well. And we'll also be doing, again, connected with the space module um, initiative with the uh, Media Labs um, uh, Space Design Exploration uh, program with the arts curator of this is a artist and engineer named Jin Liu uh, that will be uh, working with there as well. But that whole week in Cambridge will be filled with a number of other places, people, uh, and things. And so that's roughly the the overview of of what will be what the sort of the big ideas what we'll be doing, who we'll be doing it with. Uh, and so what I'd like to do now then, um, and thank you for jumping over to the other to the other broadcast here. What I'd like to do now is to just open it up for uh, for questions uh, and just and it, drop your questions into the comments field here. Uh, and we will, I'm happy to take whatever time we need to make sure that um, we get through those. And so, um, and I, as you see, I dropped in the, um, the original program presentation um, there as well. Let me also put in the, uh, just because it's probably the most, uh, widely available version of the book for now. Um, I'll put the link to the the to Amazon for the for the terraforming book. Uh, hopefully that will post. Um, so anyway, please drop please drop any questions here as well. Um, yeah, so the seminar will be available for uh, for review. Are there any, anyone would like to post some questions on here? Uh, can you tell us more details about the recommendation letter? Should, uh, should it be an, of, an official blank? Um, not sure I, I know, I'm not sure I understand what an official blank is. I can tell for the recommendation letter and, and for your statement and purpose letter in general. Um, we are looking for people who we think are a good fit for the program. Um, there isn't really a there isn't really a kind of type. I think it, in many cases the the admission process is 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 one in which it feels a bit more like casting a play than than uh, than like ranking a league table or, or or something or something like that. We want applicants who will are able to make a unique and important contribution to the research. And we want applicants who we feel will really benefit from the program. That, um, you know, it's not necessarily just one more thing along their itinerary, but for whom their participation in the program would be um, a uh, important and transformative uh, educational experience for them as well. The recommendation letter really, I, and your statement of purpose, I think should be really honest. It should, you know, it, it should be, um, what it is that you, how it is that you think, and what it is that you can do, what it is that you can make, um, and why, and what your interest is in this, in this particular, in, in this particular research, um, that will help us to understand where you would fit into, um, fit into this, the, the scheme of things with, with, within the program. Um, there are many different kinds of talents and perspectives and backgrounds that we might be looking for. Um, we want people who have who who are not necessarily the usual suspects in terms of um, their their CV. We want people who have very you know who have stellar CVs as well. Um, but in a nutshell, say so really be honest, be direct, um, and it's okay to be polemic as well. Uh, how many applicant spots are there? There are, um, as I say, we take we accept thirty people. Uh, into the program every year. Uh, I should also say, I think we, it, it's 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 known, but I'm happy to repeat that the program is also it's tuition free. Uh, 
there is no tuition for the program. In fact, the researchers are paid a, a stipend for the time that they spend in Moscow, so that no one will be will be work. Uh, well, everyone can spend their their full time um, in participating into the program. Um, we usually we usually I'll, I'll say we have several hundred applicants per year uh, uh, from Russia and abroad. Um, roughly, the applicant pool, the accepted pool, will break down between half from uh, Russian and, and Russian Federation countries and half from half from international. Uh, half architects and urbanists, half otherwise, usually half half men, half women. Uh, but that's usually the the, the pool um, in terms of this in terms of the size. And so, the acceptance rate is pretty small. Um, but uh, I think that's because it's a it's a pretty you know we have a lot of applicants because it's a very unique program. Um, it's been a very successful program, I think, with the new normal. Um, but I should say is that again. It, the way when we look at the applicants is really not like let's rank uh, rank the CVs um, uh, in terms of uh, you know in, in a sort of more nor normal way and then have a cutoff point. It really is we're really interested in uh, in characters and in bringing interesting characters into the program. Okay, so program form will be three years. I'm wondering after the completion of the course, will the research be able to continue to do something related to the course? Yes, usually they do. Um, the program, so just the program will be going for, it'll be three one-year programs, just to be clear that that's, that's the way it works. The whole thing isn't three years, but three one-year programs. So February to June, the next year it's a new cohort, the next year it's a new cohort. Um, uh, the, I can say that with the new normal program, um, several of the of the alumni of the program went on to continue to work in the teams that they had developed um, within the program. All the research work that we do is team it is, is 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 essentially team based. Um, but you'll be working with a with it's one point over the five months of the program. You'll work with all the other people in the program, and then the team that you're developing a final project with will be roughly four 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 people total. So you and you and three other people. In many cases, those teams have continued on and developed their project, developed their project further. Um, films that we've made have gone on to film festivals. Software that we've developed has gone on to multiple iter multiple iterations. Um, we had we had in the the Shenzhen uh, Architecture Biennial, uh, which is opening uh, next year. We have three of our student projects um, in the in the biennial, and as it turns out, it's it's one from it's one from each year. Um, we want to be as, as supportive as possible um, in developing uh, around this as well. But in, in each case, the projects are quite different. The people are different. The teams are different. And so what the appropriate next step is for each of those teams is kind of a case-by-case -case basis. But so far, we've done very well in getting the work out there. Um, Red most has suggested litter. So is everything I'm going to uh, OK, that's good. Uh, evolutionary biology, theoretical biology, that sounds good. Um, we want people from, uh, 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 again, uh, people from uh, who have more scientific backgrounds, who have been interested in these questions um, from a different side of the campus. Um, we see this as, as these are kinds of questions that really are too big and too complex that have to, for any, um, for any perspective, to claim some kind of mastery over. Um, and so uh, this sort of philosophy and science um, uh, philosophy in the laboratory, laboratory in the, in the, in the seminar uh, uh, approach is something we, we strongly encourage. And so those, um, it, it sounds like the, the, that background that you suggest would be something that we would, there will be slots within the cohort um, for people with that background as well. So we, we would encourage that for sure. Um, uh, 26, 26 is okay. Um, the roughly, in terms of the age range, um, the the rough age range we're sort of generally looking for is generally between 20 25 and 35 but you know it's 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 a little bit slippery case by case basis it is a postgraduate program which means that most of the participants in the program uh, have an uh, at least a you know have an advanced degree in most cases some um, some uh, you know maybe even a PhD um, but we also have a lot of people who are uh, who are coming into the program in essence as a kind of sabbatical from their um, uh, from their real world job. Uh, first year we had no second year. Second year we had, for example, we had a fellow from um, who was the director of the one of the te key technology groups at MVRDV, the Dutch design studio, who came and was with us for five months and then went back to MVRDV in a elevated position. Um, 
And so people come from a lot of different backgrounds around this as well, but 26 is fine. Um, that's not that's within our age range, so I wouldn't worry about that. Um, for artist type applicants, what do you expect the portfolio to look like? Speaking as a musician and producer, it's hard to tell if the work would be relevant. Um, I think it has to do with the you know, without knowing your work, it's a little bit it's a little bit hard to say. Um, what you want to communicate is how it is that the the ideas the the inspiration, the what you're working through in the work, regardless of the medium with which you're working, um, that the questions that you're wrestling with are the same questions that we'll be wrestling with in the program. Or that the logical next step from the questions that you've been wrestling with are the questions that we're wrestling with in the program. Anything that you can do that would make it clear to us uh, who you really are and what you're really interested in. Uh, will allow us to see clearly uh, where it might fit. Um, in many cases, you know, we don't have a kind of like set diagram. Sorry. We don't have a, a kind of set diagram in which we're trying to put people in, but rather we, we, you know, we sort of see what we have. But again, be honest, be straightforward. Um, uh, pick the pieces that show you show you in a, in, in in the best light. Um, show the range of things that you can do. Some cases, the portfolio pieces may be, may serve the purpose of showing, here's the way I'm, here's the way I think, here's the way I'm thinking through this project, here's a thematic relationship to things we're working on. In many cases, it may be, um, here is a, uh, a, a production skill, a technical skill, a representational skill, a compositional skill, um, a, uh, whether that's, you know, and whatever that, that may be. Um, image, software, writing, whatever it is, um, that is suggestive of the kind of, the kind of form uh, or the kind of medium that uh, the work might take. Um, I think both of these can work in, work in your, work in your, in, in, in your favor. Um, is there benefit to wait? Just reapplying if not accepted, not look good? No, uh, re reapplication is, is absolutely fine. Um, in fact, in a certain sense, um, uh, you know, shows that you're you're dedicated dedicated to the program. I can say that we had several people uh, in the second and third year of the new normal uh, who had applied in previous years um, and were not accepted for one reason or another. And in many cases, it happens. It has more, more to do with sort of looking at the overall composition of the cohort than than the uh, anything that was deficient in their particular application. And then they had come the second year as well. And so. Um, my my clear uh, advice would be uh, uh, if if it doesn't work out this year for whatever reason, take a look at the next year and, and the year after that. There would be the, the whatever the opposite of a penalty is um, for applying more than once. Um, that's the case. Um, should a research question be specifically to cite related to geopolitical reality um, in, in Russia? Uh, all of the projects that we're working on. Uh, that we're working on, we're working in the Shulky Institute are in essence uh, cited in Russia. Uh, that Russia is serves as as the kind of, of location by which the project would work. Um, now, the question of whether or not how this relates to the geopolitics of Russia, I guess, depends on the a, a little bit on, on on the project itself. In some cases, for the previous program, we'll just use as case of an example. Um, there were software-based projects um, that were located uh, within Russian cities um, because there was a particular contextual match there as well. But in other ways, though, though that software could have been could have been located in almost any other city. In other pro in, 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 and so the condition of locating in Russia Russia was almost as a sort of as like a, a particular case study. In other cases, however, the project really was focusing on Russia itself. Um, two last year in the new normal program, for example, of Earth and Sky was looking at, in essence, really the, Rus the Russian nation building going back to Peter the Great as a kind of terraforming process. Um, the Vault project was looking at the, 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 the energy metabolisms um, of the extraction economies in Russia. But as I mentioned in the book, uh, while Russia really is is the place where, where the projects are working and the complexities and, and, and deep historical 
uh, uh, complexities and in, in, in contradictions, if you like, of the Russian Russian circumstances is the is the site condition of it working. The question of how much of something is, is is sort of unique and specific to Russia and collapses upon export or translation, versus how much of in a way the Russian circumstance is can is in uh, something that is if not universal, uh, at least something that is not you only uniquely and locally specific um, of a, of a pro problem, of a history, uh, of a possible future. Uh, and so it's not so easy to tell always which of these, which, which of these is this is. But in, in the, the short answer is yes, we're, lo we're definitely locating this in Russia and trying to use Russia's thing, but not necessarily the geopolitics. Um, that's, that I would say in, is it's always connected to things, but it's not necessarily um, it's not necessarily the focus or, or or where things necessarily need to be framed through. Um, let's see. Uh, written text, welcome. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things that we are wanting to to shift up a little bit from the project structure from the, the new normal, and and again we. The projects, the twenty one, I think projects that we ended up with with the new normal. Um, um, were there other excellent projects, but we want to just we want to kind of reboot the program and to do something a little bit new um, and <clears throat> to continue to actually find out new things. This it, with the terraforming program, two of the important switches that we're adding, it, it, I think, it is it, it's not so much a replacement as a kind of shift of emphasis, is uh, taking more seriously <clears throat> the fact that the 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 process and craft of using cinema as a research tool um, and as a medium through which to express <coughs> and communicate research, not necessarily making movies with characters, but as a the motion image as a way to communicate research uh, and ideas, um, and it, perhaps in a es more essayistic kind of way, and to encourage uh, text-based projects. And so many of the projects that will come out of the program of the Terraform program not only would be based, done by people who have more text-based practices, um, like myself, uh, but who the projects themselves may be text-based. And the, this relationship between text and cinema, uh, particularly cinema in this more uh, speculative, essayistic, research-driven voice and, and, and vernacular and, uh, and, and text, <clears throat> the potential relationships between these, the kinds of odd new genres and subgenres that may emerge in the uh, correlation of these two sort of paths and, and new emphases um, is something that we're very interested in exploring. And so the short answer to the question, are text-based <clears throat> works acceptable in the portfolio? Absolutely. Uh, and uh, that would go for whether or not you're a fiction writer, nonfiction, social science, philosophy, whatever, um, uh, we are looking for, for this for, uh, for certain. Um, if you're not accepted but can go, in, if you are accepted but cannot go in that year, could acceptance be held for the next year? No, not generally. Um, we are. We would encourage you to apply for the for the next year, uh, and um, but we would we would be um, certainly would you know obviously as as mentioned look uh, look positively on the on the attempt to re you know to to re. Uh, uh, to that you're interested in the program that you would apply even if you hadn't gotten in this this is this is this uh, this is something we, we, we look kindly on as well the the program you know the, the composition of the 30 positions the organization of, of everything you know from the uh, uh, the visas and everything else it's a complicated pro it's a complicated process fortunately our our, our yield that is that num from the number of people we've accepted to the number of people who actually come and show up and, and accept the invitation so far has been basically 99%. There have been a, a few very, a few cases where for one reason or another, um, someone was not able to um, accept this as well, but it's usually no more than one a year. Uh, and and uh, we certainly would, would, would want to, as much as possible to make that zero year. Um, and so that we can, uh, we have a, a better sense of, of how this will, how this will work. So I, I wouldn't encourage that. And, and there is no, to be clear, there is no institutional mechanism um, by which an acceptance can be deferred. Um, let's see. When are the interviews usually conducted? And when will the results be given out? Just want to get a sense of the application timeline so I can plan accordingly. Sure. Um, 
And so uh, it's going to be in uh, in November. Is that we're going to be doing the end of the we're doing the end of the the, the interviews. Um, those will be there'll be a process by which the applications are 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 uh, are collected. Um, we will go through all of the applications um, and select, in essence, a kind of uh, semi-finalists, if you like, uh, for for the for those positions. Um, and from then, we'll select a group that we will be conducting uh, inter interviews with, and these will be in, in, at the end of November. Um, some of those people who are in Moscow, uh, as much as possible, we will we obviously will be interviewing them in person. Uh, for people who are in remote locations, we'll be doing the interviews by we'll be doing the interviews by Skype. Um, very soon after that, we, we we then lock ourselves in a room and, and and hash it out and make those decisions and let people know right away. And so, um, it may be as early as the end of November or first week of December, the very latest. But um, I would I would bet on that sort of that 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 last week of November, uh, uh, last week of November is is basically when you would have a decision uh, from us uh, if you are if you are accepted. Uh, and then you can uh, make your plans um, plans accordingly. So, actually, I'm looking at the calendar here. Um, it may, in fact, be actually then that first week of December to work this is out. So I would guess um, something like yeah, December second, third, fourth, fifth, something like that. That's when you would have. That's when everyone will have their acceptance letter around. Like, and then uh, we have time to time to make your plans. Um, yes. Yeah, so now, when we announce the session, it'll be the first week of December. Um, can you talk a little bit about the day-to-day -day experience, how much time you spend in the classroom versus out in the field? There's lectures and discussion with several hours dedicated to production afterwards. Um, arrive with laptops and stuff. Sure, Jennifer. Um, yes, I, I, in a sense, it little depends on the module you are working with. Um, roughly, the beginning of the program is more seminar-based. It's where we're kind of developing our uh, common language, um, common frame uh, set of conceptual references that we'll be using over the course of the five months, um, and so that beginning will be more seminar-based, uh, more reading, more, more re reading, more writing, and, and, and more discussion. Though I should say, even in many of the of the quote theory seminars, um, at least I'd like to do in mine, and many of the other faculty do as well, uh, is to provide a kind of prompt which will uh, start a, a group assignment that we're beginning to develop, or even in, even in that first week. Other courses, other parts of the of the of the work that's more tech that may be more technically oriented, we may be spending more time building and making. But in general, the way we like to do it is to try to um, to make the uh, the kind of more theoretical work and the technical production work a little bit simultaneous, uh, and so one is feeding into the other um, quite a lot. And so you're sort of thinking through the technology in terms of the the concepts we're working with and. Thinking through the concepts, in essence, between the, with with the technical systems that, that we were working with, I should say, in in broad strokes, however, uh, we spend a lot of time in the seminar room and the studio next door. The the researchers have a a, a room within the, the institute, which were their base. You should bring the um, you should bring laptop, bring the best you know whatever equipment that you have. Um, we have base we have some basic equipment, but for the most part, it's expected that that at this point that the researchers will bring the tools that they need. Um, to work with that, um, uh, so people bring cameras, uh, they bring laptops, um, uh, some external drives, for example. But for the most part, that's more or less what we what will all that you anyone would need um, for at least the first four months of the program is, is um, a good recent laptop and a good camera, uh, still or, or or still or video. And so the best of those that you can bring. Um, would do you well. Anything else may be supplemental, but again, it depends a little bit on your practice. For the final research projects, um, then uh, in the development of those final projects in the last in the last month, in many cases, the groups will bring in uh, more equipment that's needed, um, and we can sort of work deal with this on a more of a case by case basis um, in terms of how this will work. But in general, yes, bring a good laptop and bring a good camera. Um, equipped with certain software, it depends on what we sort of need. We, we don't have a, we don't have a computer and fabrication lab per se. We don't really do fabrication in the program for the most part. Um, the, it's it really is a design research program, um, and uh, the research work, the research outcomes, the publications are usually more as, as, usually as I said usually end up using um, cinema as a kind of wrapper 
uh, that goes around the research, kind of sequences and explains a lot of what's going on, or in the score, and, and also even what's going on within the software itself. And so, there's not a, oftentimes not a lot of um, 3D printed objects, for example, um, of how this would sort of work. And so, that's not something that we have on camp on on site. If we're coming to Shoka with a really specific research program related to it, we'll be able to focus on it, or we'll be contributing to different backgrounds working on teams. Yes, it's clear. Um, you, it, 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 we don't actually encourage this in, in a way that, that we, we, that you, it's not, it, put it this way, it, you should, one shouldn't think of the program um, like a residency. Uh, uh, and that's not the way we're looking at the applicants. We're, we're not asking applicants to have a, we're not asking applicants, be very clear, to have a, 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 a you know, a, a fully articulated research project that they want to work on uh, on site um, at, at Strelka, and then evaluating which research projects we want to support, the way in which a, a, an artist residency, for example, might work, or even a, a postdoc residency uh, might work in general. Um, we're presuming that uh, uh, that in, in, in your cases that the projects that will develop in that fifth month of the program uh, will come out of organically the research that we're doing in the first four months of the program. And that at the beginning, we may have some sense of where we want to go and the types of questions we want to ask, of course. Um, but in terms of really specifically what those projects are going to be and how they're going to be developed, uh, we need to let that work a bit, a bit organic. We need to let that work a bit organically. Um, and that's worked really well. Um, that's worked really well for us in the past. I can say that over the course of that first four months, the researchers will be doing multiple design charrettes. And so you'll have we'll be working with, okay, here's a prompt, here's a problem. You'll break into groups. We will quickly art iterate and articulate a possible response uh, to this. Um, those are meant really as a kind of exercise, not to make work that we would ever show anybody in the outside world, but really using the kind of design uh, design methodologies as a way of thinking through the issue and, and, and their and then having um, uh, outcomes and responses that we can we can communicate and discuss with one another uh, in, 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 one, in one way or another. And so that making process is is really an important part of our of how we think, the thinking tied into the making as well. All of which is to say is that if you've got really clear and specific ideas for things that you're gonna wanna work on, you may have opportunities to to sort of to bring that to the table and to kind of break it through, but your expectation should be that by the time you get to that fifth month, that you will have, in essence, gone way beyond that. Uh, that you you've you arrived at something that may incorporate some of the key ideas that you that you brought with you, of course, but the end result is something that's you know you've gone from a three dimensional to an eleven dimensional project, uh, and that's the point. Um, so Terraform project development is about working alone or in teams. Um, generally, uh, for the most part, as I said, in teams. Uh, now, for the first four months of the program, we mix it up quite a bit. Um, for a lot of these different charrettes, um, it's kind of like, you know, you, you, you will over the court, uh, the hope is, and what we've done so all, each of the years in the past is that everyone, each of the researchers will have, a, will have work in a team with all 29 of the other researchers at least once. Uh, as, as they've gone as they've gone through this program and then <clears throat> at the at the end of the four months uh Nikolai Voyezhev who's the other the Stroka faculty member who who uh, will be on site with you um the course of the whole the whole five months Nikolai Voyezhev is the faculty member who, who was there the, the entire time um Nikolai and I um break up the groups into the in, we, we sort of uh, steer them into the groups into the final projects of this well but the, the the basic answer to the question is it's pretty much group-based research um but uh you're not you, you you within that there's a lot of movement and a lot of leeway for everyone to find, have their own voice um and to articulate their own perspective um for sure um let's see Will technical skills be focused on the final project outcomes, such as cinemal text? Yes, of course. Um, the uh, we 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 expect everyone to have some skill that they you know tech some kind of skill of research 
and articulation and representation that they uh, are trained in, that they can bring to the work and to the and, and ultimately to the to the group project. That can range from programming to writing to filmmaking uh, to uh, to uh, you know uh, effects design. Everyone has, everyone should have something that they can bring to this in terms of in terms of this articulation. If you're not, if cinema is not necessarily something that you have a lot of background in, that in no way disqualifies you as a candidate. Um, but you should have something that you can bring into this as well. Again, we've had journalists, writers. It doesn't necessarily have to be a, what we think of it conventionally as a super technical skill. Um, uh, I still think that you know writing is is still the best design software. In, in, you know, in, in many cases it, it, as well. If, however, since I should say, you know, just to be very clear, that since people are, um, that since people are, that the, the, the cinematic focus is something that we're sort of emphasizing this year, that people who do have that background, uh, who do have, uh, and do have a, a kind of overlap of the, of, of the, of the research interests, um, of the portfolio of work and research that's related to the terraforming work and also have some kind of cinematic um, experience, whether, you know, basic, whether that's from 3D to basic timeline structures, after effects, all any of these kinds of things as well, would certainly be people that would seem to be uh, logical fits for the program. It doesn't necessarily exclude anyone else, but that would be one overlap point that would seem to make sense for us for sure. Um, I'm an architect, but I do more architectural work, speculative and otherwise. How important is the 150 word limit in the portfolio? Um, I, I, I think you want to keep it keep it concise. Um, we we as again half of the program are people who have an architecture or urbanism background. Um, in terms of the projects that you pick, my real recommendation would be twofold. One, pick projects that thematically, in terms of the research idea seem to would arc in the direction of the type of work that you would likely be doing in the program that would give us a sense of how it is that you translate um, concepts into speculative work and that the kind of speculative work that maybe you've done in the past would seem to be great that's the kind of speculative work we'd like to do here in the program and projects that demonstrate um, a kind of representational brilliance uh, and technical skill that may not, uh, that may have been employed in the service of something that was a little bit less speculative, but we could still take a look at it and say, um, uh, this person has fantastic representational skills, and we can certainly uh, help them use this in a way in which in support of the support of the speculative project. Um, teaching a two-day workshop is that geared? The, the IRC application refers to teaching a two-day workshop. Is that geared towards getting an idea of interest, knowledge, expertise, or is that an actual part of the program? Um, it's both. Uh, it, it's both. Uh, we. It, it's a very packed schedule, um, and so doing the two-day, if having everyone do a two-day workshop, we have thirty researchers. If everyone do a two-day workshop, that's sixty days. Um, the whole program is five months. Uh, that would take up a lot of a, a lot of the, a lot of the program, and so it's not a absolute requirement that everyone do a, that everyone do a two-day program. Um, a, a two-day workshop. However, every year, uh, several students do, uh, and in many cases, it ends up being a kind of something that uh, ends up being a kind of a uh, little bit more self-organized and sort of organically develops. Where, perhaps, in ways in which we didn't really, we never really anticipated. Um, for example, first year, the first year, three years ago, we ended up doing a lot of work um, in processing. And we had Casey Rias came and talked with us as well, but we didn't expect necessarily the processing was going to be um, a big part of the way in which we were doing in that case for uh, dynamic data visualization. And so we had some of the students who had worked uh, with processing for years did a workshop around it. And so, um, yes, it is part of the program, but it's not, it's not an absolute requirement that everyone do this. It is, however, a great way we found to think about what that workshop might be that you would do uh, is to get a sense of, of to get a sense of the kind of how you see your practice, um, the kind of really practical contribution that you think you could make 
to the work that other people need to have. I mean, again, this could be technical. Um, this could be something that's more qualitative, research oriented. It doesn't necessarily have to be a, here's, I know how to use this software and I'll show you how to use the software. Though, of course, that's, that's wonderful and that ends up being part of that. But um, we want to get a sense of both conceptually and practically how people would contribute to the research. Uh, we want people who can ideally walk and chew gum at the same time, who can work across both aspects of that, ideally. Um, and so understanding you know, what, uh, what uh, you might be able to teach the rest of us is part of this. And, and I, I think that's really a kind of a big part of it is that we see the, the relationship between the faculty and, and the researchers not in a, a kind, in, not in necessarily in the same sort of conventional uh, uh, sort of one-way learning model where the, there's faculty that will download the download the the knowledge to the to the to the students, but rather there's there's 30 researchers who are there for five months. We're all collaborating. We're all working together. We're all learning from each other. Uh, we are all teaching each other. We're all responsible to each other. We're responsible to each other's for each other's work. Uh, and way of thinking through the workshop may have to do with you drawing a picture for us um, of what that contribution might look like in a nutshell. So it's both. Um, let's see. Will DIY, Andrea, will DIY approach to content production be considered uh, an access? Um, sure. Uh, I'm not sure, I guess maybe I'm not sure entirely what what that might what that might mean. Uh, I, I mean, I suppose that could mean a, a few different kinds of things as well. Um, but yeah, in general, I think we uh, we like to we like to think through making. Um, and and so uh, people who I, I suppose the sort of the approach to a complex problem of Thinking about ways in which you can uh, use whatever to, whatever is at hand uh, to reframe, reformulate, recode, refashion uh, that uh, uh, from where you're where you're standing right now um, is 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 something that we or something that we admire. Um, but but at the same time, we also have had people from participant, you know, people who've spent their the, their previous lives working in very large organizations with, with large groups that's very, very, very collaborative. Um, and so I would suppose the DIY approach of, um, I'm going to figure out how to deal with this com complex situation by, by a kind of trial and error, hacking and remaking of it to figure out how it works and how everything, absolutely. Um, if that means I don't play well with others, that's what it's meant by DIY. Then maybe, maybe, maybe not so much. So I, I hope that sort of answers the, the general question. Um, would a background law and business be relevant to your textbook? Well, yes, for sure. Um, absolutely. Uh, many of the, the the projects that have come out of the program have been, in essence, I guess you could call it a kind of speculative policy or preemptive policy. Um, we, I, I, the way I would put it, I guess, is like this. One of the things that we're very interested in with when it comes to the, the role of design uh, within these processes as a kind of modeling and expertise in, in sort of modeling and, and simulation and prefiguration of projective models of possible solution vectors uh, is, is how it is that uh, design can sort of move upstream in this process and how it is that it can might operate less as a kind of, uh, you know, the, at the end of a value chain that is making, uh, putting one brick on top of another, but rather becomes part of a, a much more strategic uh, phase of a, of a, of a thinking, thinking through this, thinking, th thinking through the project. Uh, how in design going upstream in many cases means changing the terms and protocols and platforms through which um, the rest of a, of a social system, economic system may 
may, may, may descend from one way or another. And so the design of, we've had projects that are really focusing in many ways on the design of legal protocols. The design of the speculative design of different modes and modalities of jurisdictional systems. Uh, and so it's not only design as a kind of me it, it, in this as, as in the articulation of a legal or political or um, would you call it a kind of business idea it's it's the it, it's the design as the as the initial conceptualization of an alternative path for those things and what those models might in fact look like in and of themselves um so yes claude that would be a, that would be a good answer um how necessary is the toefl certificate around this world the program is in English. Um, the whole program is in English. We do have, you know, the half of the half of the the cohort is um, Russian or Russian Federation, so it's in Moscow. So obviously, there's a lot of Russian spoken. Um, but the the lingua franca of the program is is English. It is um, uh, a pretty, especially earlier in the program with some of the theoretical sessions, a pretty advanced. Uh, advanced English. Uh, we go fast. We read big books. Uh, we we you know we talk through it at a, at a at a pretty high level. And I would say that um, anyone who is less than comfortable with their ability to uh, at least to understand and, and and to participate in in, in those discussions may uh, may find some difficulty uh, may find some difficulty in that. And so. Um, I wouldn't. Uh, I, I would definitely encourage you to 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 make sure that that's not an issue. Um, let's see. In the DIY sense of making the best use of tools at your disposal, despite the limitation in budget. Yes, a hundred percent. That aspect of DIY is a is is a huge part of what we're looking for. Um, we we do a huge amount with a very economical, um, uh, we, like the exact right resources that we need. Uh, and so, for sure. Um, if I'm from the UK but studied another language, do not have an English certificate, is there a way to do one? Uh, is, is there a way to not have to do one? Uh, I guess I'm not quite. I guess I'm not sure. Question. I, I guess this may be a more technical question. You may want to ask it more specifically to the to the program as well. I can, if you want to, uh, email the admissions group. I'm not quite sure. I understand. It, 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 the idea is that you you're quite fluent in English. Um, but because of your passport, you would qualify for someone who would have to do the TOEFL, but you want to demonstrate that this isn't necessary, something along these lines. Um, I, again, I would just, maybe this is more of a technical question to pass along to admission. But if you wanted to clarify it a little bit more, um, we, can, we can do that. So all the admin stuff around this, um, is also going to be addressed next week uh, by Nikolai Boychev, who's doing the uh, the uh, the second of these conferences uh, around as well. So you can speak to this as well. Um, let me also make sure that there's the I can give you the right uh, email for any of those other questions. Okay. Um, anyone else would like to uh, have a uh, offer a have a question. So the, it's the email that you're going to want to. Yes, I'm having it. Is just apply at strelka.com, uh, and some of those questions can be answered. Uh, so I, I think, if, are there any other questions around the program or the faculty or the admissions process or anything else that I might be able to answer for you? Those are still fifty some people online, so I just want to make sure that we that we take the opportunity to make sure that we're everyone's getting their getting their opportunity. Um, why did I decide to work on this project? Great question. Um, I think that just well, I'm. This is the fourth year I've done this thing as well, and I can say that it's been uh, one of the most rewarding uh, educational initiatives I've ever been part of. Um, I teach at a number of different schools, as you know, uh, and I think that the 
the intensity and the honesty uh, and the fearlessness of the work that we, that we are able to do in Stroka is unlike, uh, unlike I see any, anywhere else. And part of it has to do with the intensity of the program of taking 30 really smart people and locking them in a room for five months and then bringing in, you know, a, a lot of really, really uh, brilliant thinkers and designers and writers and um, talking it through. Uh, and so on the really most selfish level, the reason we're doing it is because I get so much out of it, because the opportunity to to be part of this conversation, be part of this community is one that I really treasure. Um, and I, I feel just extremely honored to have been able to have a hand in trying to compose this. Um, and I suppose the that's kind of the second aspect of this is that you don't necessarily, the opportunity to put together a, a, a program from scratch where the mandate is what are the most significant design research problems that we need to be working on right now? Uh, and who do we need to be working on them with? Go. Whatever we need to do, uh, obviously within logical constraints, uh, is not, 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 such a, uh, not such a common uh, opportunity, to be honest, uh, and something that uh, I feel Again, I'm very proud of the work that we're doing it and very happy to be able to use this, that the way in which I choose to answer that, my way of answering that question uh, of what we should be thinking about and who should we be thinking about with uh, as a really important part of my, uh, my own practice, right? It's a way in which that uh, my own work uh, develops in collaboration with everyone else. And so... Um, that's really the that's really the, the answer to this. I, I would say that the Strelka Institute itself is an extremely special place, um, as as you'll see. Its role within um, cultural life, intellectual life in Moscow, is absolutely essential. There aren't a lot of places like it. Um, it is an island of oxygen, uh, one that's very much needed. And it's a project that, in that sense, that I'm very happy to um, support as much as I can. I think it's very important that projects like Stroka in places like Moscow continue to um, continue to thrive, and it is thriving. Um, but at the same time, I think that if we had done this project, the, the postgraduate program in um, New York or Berlin or London or Los Angeles, um, it wouldn't it wouldn't be the same. There's um, there's an importance, I think, particularly for the international students to get out of a a particular a particular bubble, really, uh, and to see and to sort of work through the work through these questions from a ways that isn't quite so. Um, uh, culturally incestuous and even self-censorious uh, as you can find whenever you have relatively uh, um, a kind of hothouse conditions in any of those cities. Um, I, I think for the many of the, the Russian students that that encounter uh, is, is equally is equally productive and and pr provocative. Um, and so uh, this is also a hugely important part of it, and it's been it's been really important for me as well. So that that's really the answer to the, the question. Um, let's see. Yeah, there's the question. Sorry, the question was unclear. I was merely wondering if the certificate itself is so important with the sufficient level. Um, yeah, just message them as well. Will the second year be different? Um, yes, hopefully. Uh, Generally, we, you know, we try to, it's a balance of trying to keep a consistency between the, the first three years that we solve problems and then don't have to sort of solve them again. We see this at, but, but we won't need to actually take, we need to actually uh, learn from what we've learned in one year and apply it to how it is that we ask the questions differently or ask different questions 
uh, in the subsequent year. We see this as a three as as the whole thing as a kind of collaborative three-year research cycle uh, that 90 researchers will have been a part of, uh, an equal number of faculty will have been a part of, and we will produce this this body of work at, at the end of it. Um, for the most part, through the program, the faculty will remain 80% the same. Um, we sort of move, you know, move things around a little bit to optimize for some of the different questions. The core research questions we'll be asking the second year, I don't know what they are because we haven't, we haven't done the first year yet. But the, the second year questions, the sort of, uh, er, sort of uh, research focused themes emerge from the work that came out of the first year. In the research in those research or core research questions for the third year again will all be within the terraforming but let's say the more specific uh the more specific thematic topics that we've been trying to sort of move in on that greater detail um that 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 goes year to year and we, we try to learn from that um and so it'll be the same but it'll be it but it but it'll be different as well um but it, it's it's a, it is a three-year initiative in many cases as well though i should say you know the first year is usually the one that sets in a certain sense sets the table for what comes next it doesn't always result in the most um in, in the work that's the most uh that has resolved the issues the best because we're we have we've only we've gone through one iteration of it as well but it definitely does sort of set the direction um the terraforming question, are the questions regarding knowledge flows globally? Uh, are there the questions on knowledge flows? Yes, by all means. Um, the question of, it, 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 and even in a way that may be even more expansive and, and radical than that question might be normally posed, um, the question of planetarity and what a, an, an alternative planetarity looks like and how it would be construction and viable is, is really the, the core question here as well. We try to make the program as international as possible. Um, we don't get as many applicants. We get applicants from certain parts of the, more applicants from certain parts of the world than we do from other parts of the world. In an ideally, ideally, I would like the 30 researchers to look like the representative earthlings, that that is that is the kind of distribution of what earthlings look like. I would like the faculty to, to do so as well. It, this is a process of bending a, bending a discourses in new directions and to new places, but absolutely as much as possible. It is our, it is our hope and intention to, um, bend the discourses in, in these different directions and and have the discourses and stuff be informed and bent uh, uh, and sort of retaken and retrain um from uh people traditions places approaches um that have not always been at the center of the those position the positions of that deliberation that the the kind of that if the planetary if planetarity itself implies a, a certain kind of a certain kind of cosmopolitan universalism. It's one that we don't have yet. It's one that we actually have to make, have to invent, and have to enforce, uh, and have to describe. It's not. It's not given in in any sense whatsoever. And so, I don't think we're there yet. I don't think that the program is. If you're asking me, I don't think the program. This first iteration of the program is um, universal enough. I don't. I don't think it is, and it's something that we need to. We need to. Um, uh, we want to sort of build in, in this direction. And so the answer is emphatic yes in terms of the knowledge flow in different directions for sure. Um, why a three-year cycle? Um, because I think that the questions that we're working with are ones that are kind of too big and difficult to answer in just, five, in just one year. Um, and that what it allows it to do is it allows the faculty to to think of their involvement within the program is not just I'm coming for a few weeks and then I'm gone, but rather that uh, in many cases, what kind of research could they do that is either based in Russia or is informed by these questions or is informed by the thematic issues of, for example, the terraforming, where they have the runway to develop a new 
a new path of research for themselves, that they use their participation in the program as the kind of platform to develop. And so we take the whole thing as a kind of longer term collaborative project. And so I, I just think the depth of the work and the depth of the questions that we want to ask are ones that require um, some, um, uh, uh, require a bit of aging, require a, a way to, uh, to develop a version of it, to let it settle, to come back to it, re-ask the questions, let it settle, re-ask the questions, and then by the end of it, we'll have um, we'll have an accumulation of of, of, of ideas and works that um, uh, that that will see all of well, everyone will see themselves in not only the work that they have their name on, uh, uh, both the researchers and the faculty, and that hopefully uh, that whole body of work uh, will be one that introduces different languages, different perspectives, different ways of, of thinking, uh, thinking, thinking and working that ends up, ends up having a longer term impact than just the projects themselves, um, which goes to a little bit of a question about the audience for this. Um, there's certain audiences that, are, you know, kind of follow what's going on in design schools uh, and sort of, you know, move with the, uh, move with the winds uh, to keep up with things. And that's great. That's how the discipline develops. It is like somebody does one in one place, it influences something somebody else does somewhere else, which influences something else. And that's how the collaboration of a, a discipline is a big discontiguous, um, you know, somewhat depersonalized collaboration amongst a group of people who are working on similar issues. And that's wonderful. Um, and so that's part of it. Uh, we want to be copied. We'd love for, and we've seen this a lot within normal, we would like uh, other programs uh, to do work like we do, or to do their version of the kind of work that uh, that we like to do. But in another sense, it's like any other kind of speculative work, the hope is to shift the, shift the Overton window a bit on what's what's plausible and what's, what's, what's necessary. And to try to answer the question of not just, you know, how it is that we might criticize uh, and unpack and deconstruct uh, a circumstance that we feel is uh, 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 inadequate, but to actually take the, the kind of risky move of trying to project and articulate what um, uh, what alternatives really might look like in one, in, in one way or another. And so it's a balance. On the one hand, there's an expert audience that we're trying to speak to who kind of follows this kind of work and understands the connotations and references of the moves that get made in different projects. And on the other hand, um, I'd love, you know, we, I'd love to find with this new normal work that we're doing, I'd love for a used version of this new normal work to show up somewhere five years from now um, somebody's looking for some, you know, someone is looking for something else and they run across it in a library somewhere. Um, and they open it up to page 176 and they see something there that, uh, changes the way they look at everything. Um, and that might, that person might not be in design. They might be in something else. I mean, our, our you know, the idea is not in the developments and the origination of new concepts and possibilities is that you hope that they take on a life of their own um, beyond the authorship. And so I guess the bigger answer to the question is, is um, there's part of the question is that how we do this as authors of this work. And then the, maybe the more important question is the ways in which when we let go of the authorship, the, the work itself um, ends up really having an impact. And that's what we hope. Um, thanks for your time. What are the students doing afterwards? Many design projects normally end up in the archive. How does the program sustain outcomes? What are some of the trajectories? Short. Um, the, the, the alumni of the programs and the work of the programs um, obviously take on life of their own after the program is done. It, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, but happy to reiterate, um, many of the, the teams that have worked together in the program are still working together. Um, they, maybe they've developed this project a little bit further. The project has gone on to do other things. As, as mentioned, we've got three projects in the Shenzhen Biennial this year, student projects from, I mean, researcher projects from the last three years. Films have gone on to film festivals. Some of the software is in multiple iterations of this as well. 
Um, the projects have gone on and received external grant support, other kinds of things. The, um, some of the, the, the cohorts um, have, have, have started new initiatives that, um, that were based on the research and the work that they've done and, and based on the, the collaborations that were developed at Strelka. Um, the trust space in Berlin um, is a good example of that. It was founded and run by um, uh, Strelka alumni, and, and it's been a way in which that cohort, it, it, those those alumni, in, in you know, of their own initiative, um, have extended this this in different ways. Well, and so the the simple answer to the question is it's is it depends on on, on the person and depends on the kind of on the on the kind of work, um, uh, the kind of work the kind of work that's there. Um, in terms of the institute side, a lot of what we do is, is promotional of the work. Of, like the work is being shown somewhere. Um, the network of the institute is, is, is making sure that everyone knows about it and the rest of, the, of, of this as well. But um, all of the projects in one way or another have taken on a life of their own after the, after the program. Um, and it's it's a little bit hard to say like what the exact what the what the recipe for that is. It really is a kind of person by person uh, and case by case basis. We have some alumni who come back and are teaching in the program uh, as, as tutors now. Um, we have publishing work by some of the, the alumni in, in, in the program. Uh, and so we, we, you know, there's lots of ways in which the, the, the continued involvement is encouraged and supported um, either directly or as we see in many cases, the most amazing ones are just ones where people, people made lifelong, uh, friendships and relationships as being part of the program and have gone on and decided to um, uh, spend the next few years of their lives working together. Um, and that's obviously, as I say, the development of the new kinds of urban practices coming out of the program. Um, that's exactly what we want. Um, let's see. Can you have several recommendations? Uh, I believe so. I believe that there you have the opportunity to put more than one recommendation uh, in there as well, but I'll leave to uh, to Vlad to answer that specifically. But I think that's the idea, actually. Um, does it make sense to send a portfolio without an English certificate in order to understand the compliance of the parameters? I, again, Igor, I think that's going to be that's we're probably better suited if you want to ask that uh, send this these these kind of questions directly to apply at strelka.com, a p p l y at strelka.com. And we can give you really much more specific technical answers, de detailed answers to some of these questions that relate specifically to the uh, uh, to the applicant to the particulars of the application process uh, as well. Let's see. I'm trying to. I'm having. I'm. I'm wondering whether or not the issue has to do with Chrome. The issue we had with the audio earlier. <clears throat> has to do with Chrome's not playing well with the new Mac OS um, because I'm also not able to post uh, links in here as well. So I'm going to ask Vlad to post this link to the to the book. Um, and so it may be in a, maybe this kind of issue. Uh, are there any other questions or comments about the program? Uh, unsure whether I fully agree with some of your standpoints or even if the standpoints established by the program would be still valuable to apply. Uh, Perhaps, uh, right? I don't know. It, it kind of depends on what the uh, what the nature of the disagreement is, or whether the disagreement is more of uh, emphasis um, or than direction. But um, yeah, I mean, we have thirty people. Everybody's got different approaches and different ideas, and comes from different backgrounds. And, and I think that we want the research we want to explore these questions in a way in which we honestly arrive at the answers i think if we come and approach them as if we already know what the answers are um then uh, then we don't really learn it then I, I, we don't really learn anything and i mean I, i'm speaking of myself um and so i, I was as well but i'd also would be you know if you i'm interested if there if you want to be more specific in terms of what the what some of those standpoints uh might be, uh, I might be able to provide you with a more uh, a more specific answer on whether or not you're valuable to apply. But but um, in in general, yeah, we have you know we have people with lots of different ideas and lots of different perspectives be, being part of the program. And I, I think, um, as I say, disagreement is is uh, disagreement is 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 hopefully hopefully productive. Um, 
doesn't mean that we end up always having to agree at, at the end. Um, I will say, though, I think in a certain sense that what we're trying to do with the program, and at least what I'm trying to do, especially with the book, is to, I think is based on an idea that not only are the, is the, the way in which we, the way in which the current form of planetarity that we have composed is operating is essentially is essentially pathological um, and deeply self-destructive. And the question of what we, how we, what we need to do about this uh, is, is to be pressing, but also that in many respects, the kind of conventional ways in which we think about how to resist or to respond to this circumstance are deeply neurotic. Uh, it's the problem is not only the problems themselves. Part of the problem is the is the conventional vocabulary and menu of um, supposed solutions that we're supposed to have to this. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm as big of a critic I think as anyone of 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 kind of solutionism in the technological sense, as though a magic machine can sort of appear. Um, and and solve and, and and kind of solve everything in one way or another, but I suppose I'm equally critical of what might think of as political solutionism. Um, that if we can simply organize ourselves to articulate, um, uh, to articulate a kind of uh, uh, voice of of of, 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 uh, of what it is to do, and that the proper if we can make the proper gesture and hone the proper gesture. Uh, and to form the proper articulation, then from this, everything will subsequently solve itself, uh, is also, I think, equally, na is equally naive, um, one or the other. And so, long way of saying, I, don't I honestly don't know what, your, what your, your questions are, but I'm very happy to engage if you like, um, is that uh, we need different plant, we need different, we need different paths out of this, we need different models, we need a different way of thinking about this. Um, that some of the some of the ways, and particularly in the West, that some of the that that um, we've understood the relational dynamics between the political, the economic, and the technical, um, what constitutes left, right, up, down, uh, are not uh, are too low resolution. Uh, we need we need other we need another pass through this as well, uh, and so. Um, I don't know. Maybe perhaps some of the disagreement is is more of a matter of um, uh, not recognizing a prior set of commitments in what the program is articulating, and that may be the case, and that also may be the point. Uh, it doesn't mean that we necessarily disagree with those prior commitments. It means that we're trying to develop something else. But again, if you want to speak further, go ahead. Um, Anything else that we have here as well? Okay, so then I've also then, so there we go. Um, so Vlad has then posted the, the link, the Amazon link for the essay. Um, th again, that's the digital version of it. There is a print version that will be available through Amazon as well. Um, you know, I'll say that, you know, there's the, the, you know, as all of these kinds of digital books circulate through informal channels, this one is already circulating through informal channels as well. Um, anything else? Any other questions um, that I can ask for you as well? And again, Brian, I didn't mean to, I'm happy to engage on the topic further if you like. Um, it's about setting up a rhetoric or narration system for the shifting geopolitical and planetary realities, right? Um, I would, I don't know if it's a rhetoric or a narrative system exactly. I suppose the way in which, um, I think a different sort of language or a different set of definitions for certain kinds of convention of uh, things that we think we understand um, uh, is an important part of this, uh, and, and and that is that's part of I guess I was saying shifting of models. We have descriptive models, predictive models, projective models, which are not describing or predicting, but are trying to um, to prefigure what should happen. To make a normative claim, um, indeed, on what on what is what 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 should come next. Um, 
I think a lot of what we're really coming down, what it comes down to, and what with a design program can contribute to this is the articulation of um, of alternate models of of what uh, of, of what that geopolitical and geotechnical uh, circumstance uh, might look like in reality. And that is not only in the future; it's also a different models of understanding the past, uh, uh, and indeed and understanding the present, obviously as well. But um, I suppose I sort of think of it like this. I mean, I mentioned in the in the um, in the lecture a little bit about this, about the importance of what we call Copernican turn. Um, and I'll, I don't need to drag this out, but I, I would more specifically define the Copernican turn this way: as we are, we as a species uh, are able to create models of the world that are quite nuanced and complex, causal models, allegorical models. Uh, and because we're able to do this, we are not only able to communicate and articulate those models through text or image, but we're also able to create technologies that allow us to act on the world in accordance with the, 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 the predictive or capacities of those models. We make a tool based on the way in which the model would imply the world works. Sometimes, and we use these to do things. Now, sometimes, however, those technologies, when used properly, not only are able to let us do something to the world, they actually transform how, they, they reveal that the world doesn't work the way we thought it worked. That we, met, we have a model of the world that allows us to create a technology that when used properly, one of the things the technology discloses or reveals is that the model that we had of how the world worked is wrong. And that's when it turns out that's one of the things that technology actually did. It's not, not just the function it was used for. It was, in essence, the disclosure. Um, it's not a new idea. Um, but it was. it is one that can be interpreted in a few different ways. And I think one of the ways in which I think we're interpreting this differently than the Heideggerian tradition, for example, is that these moments of technical alienation, by which a counterintuitive, non-intuitive, non-ground-based uh, understanding of the world is a priceless accomplishment. These Copernican traumas are calling them a kind of priceless accomplishment. Um, and what that allow, what that forces us to do is to revise the model, is to try to understand uh, if that old model doesn't work, then we need a, we need a different model to make it kind of work. And then there are implications of that new model. Okay, so if the world actually is different in this way, um, that if Telescopes demonstrate that you know heliocentrism. AI demonstrates that intelligence is emergent property of matter. Changes the model, but then the model then should change not only how we understand ourselves in the world, it should change how we remake the world uh, and make and, and 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 remake the world at the scale of a city, um, at the scale of a tool, a software, at the scale of an ecological system, or or, or and this as well. It's a long answer to the question, but really, I suppose the more the the, the more specific answer to the question would be: we want to make, um, we want to demonstrate um, alternative models for how the world and how the systems in which we are articulating um, might be different rationales, um, certain ones that may look quite strange. Uh, and uh, again, unlikely, but I think really based not on their on their kind of poetic whimsy, but on the on the kind of deeply functional that, that they're in a way more functional than the commonsensical way of approaching it, um, and that there is hopefully a kind of um, shock that that an audience or someone seeing the the project might do, and a kind of realization that. Uh, that the question that the way in which you would arrive at that kind of answer would be implied by asking a very different kind of set of questions um, and setting aside a different sort of frame of reference for the sort of articulation of this as well. Um, so, but setting up a different rhetoric and narration system for shifting planetary realities, yes, sure. In addition to those things, it's that, that's sometimes a means and that's sometimes an end. Um, Frank Sushant, activism playing a role in the idealization and production of the projects, and how do you see activism as a tool for the course? Um, I guess it depends on what you mean, what the notion of activism means. Um, I, I think that um, uh, 
we want to ask fundamental questions about the way in which planetary systems operate, um, more fundamental probably than are usually uh, we usually have time for, and what the, our role within this is, is well, how the cities function within this in particular, how our technical system, cultural system, social systems, ecological systems function within inside of this. We, it's a program about first principles. Um, and as you know, the etymology of the term radical is to go to the root of something, sort of going to the first principle uh, of a process uh, of something and trying to act upon that process at the level of the first principle, at the root of it. Uh, and in that sense, uh, I think the program is, is, is radical. Uh, I think that uh, we are interested that nothing is off balance in terms of the kind of research topics that we can approach within the program. Um, there's no, in, in many respects, it, it seems kind of weird to say, but in many respects, I think we, pro we have, there's forms of research freedom that maybe we can explore within the Stroka program that I would probably be um, more hesitant to introduce in a context here in California um, for any number of different reasons in terms of some of the expectations of the neoliberal university more generally. Um, I, I would say, I, I guess from my way of looking at it, all of the projects that we've done in the program have been activist projects in a way or another in that they are um, seeking to go really to the root of a problem to introduce um, not just a criticism or a deconstruction of the problem, but a active intervention uh, into the implications of the radical perspective on the problem. Um, in some ways, these kinds of work may be quite recognizable within, I suppose, the kind of genre of work that you might recognize as, as activist work. In some cases, maybe less recognizable within the genre. Um, and I, 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 and to me, that, that maybe doesn't, that isn't, maybe doesn't matter so much uh, whether or not this worked this way. Um, I, I guess I would put this, I would put in this sense, for the design program, our interest is in, in the sort of going to the root of the issue, is in not only in, is in the criticism and the deconstruction and the articulation of the position of resistance to a particular momentum within that, within that circumstance, but then to take the next step, which is in some cases more risky uh, and uncertain, uh, and that is to the formulation, articulation, and modeling of uh, a, an unexpectedly functional, viable alternative to that situation, and to not uh, to not pause at simply at that moment of at the moment of criticism, as if that were the the purpose of, of the exercise. I don't think for us it's the that can be a means, but it's not necessarily the it's not necessarily the end. But I, I, maybe you're asking the question with a slightly different balance. I can say that in many that in, if the general question is, um, uh, is it possible to uh, is it possible really to ask ask questions and frame these issues that really go to the heart of the matter in terms of um, human power relations, um, the distribution of of resources, the distribution of access? Absolutely. Our interest is in the articulation and modeling of alternatives to that circumstances, rather than in the um, the kind of performative recapitulation of um, the uh, of, of the demonstrating a resistance to the status quo. It needs to be a different status quo. Um, you probably answered this, but how much of the program fit way over? This program fit way over other criteria. I'm likely too young to apply with no work experience other than a research lab, but I fit well. Give it a shot. Um, the 20, the, the, the age limit, the 25 year old age cutoff limit is, is gently guideline. Um, program fit is big. Program fit is big. Um, we, we, we want the best, we want the people who will fit the best for the program, um, for sure. And I would say that in, um, if you're weighing it one way or another, 
Um, I think that that's something that you should, you, you, you definitely should sort of think about this as well. If you don't have as much of a portfolio or as much of a work experience, that means that there's other things that you may have to do um, to make the case, uh, to demonstrate why the program fit actually is such a good program fit for you. Um, and do whatever it takes, be creative, um, be concise, uh, be clear. Uh, on, on, on what that argument would be made to just as well, but you know, don't, don't be, um, uh, uh, if you feel the program is a good fit, tell us why. Simple as that. Um, how much do you see, let's see, the stack model uh, is articulated in the 26 teacher that play, play a role in the terraforming program? Um, I, I think it, it does in a few ways, but um, I guess I would put it like this, I, 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 I mean, in a number of ways, but the two probably the most important ones are an interest in uh, the role of infrastructural systems and understanding of the geography of infrastructural systems as the, um, as something that is uh, essential to understanding any kind of geopolitical or geocultural circumstance first need to understand the structures of, in, of infrastructural systems and, uh, and in doing so be open to an understanding that the way in which we may the way in which we may see ourselves reflected in those infrastructural systems is not always the same as the way in which those infrastructural systems see us or allow for and configure our agency in the world that they are that there's a bit of a challenge to a um the con a, a more conventional neoliberal notion of the sovereignty of subjective agency and those infrastructural systems are in many cases uh, highly modularized that it's 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 about how platform systems take on a logic of their own that they have a generative quality that is not easily reducible to simply criticisms of state models or, or market models, but constitute something that's a little bit strange in themselves that we're swimming inside of, but maybe have a difficult time mapping. And so I think this is a big part of it. And then the question of how you, what kinds of transformations in the system are possible when you see the thing as a whole. The second aspect of it, and that definitely is part of the whole thing. I think the question of, of how it is that if the circumstances in which we find ourselves are one in which anything is available potentially for kind of wholesale replacement, that the cities might be in the wrong place, uh, where water systems, energy systems, food systems are structuring. These are infrastructural issues. They're not ones that are going to be solved in the accumulation of uh, subjective gestures. They need to be solved at the scale of their actual operations, which is geographic, planetary. Um, and that's a big part of it as well. But the other thing, really, I think, is what do we use planetary scale computation for? Um, and this, the question of, as again mentioned, that climate change itself can be understood as a kind of epistem ep epistemological accomplishment of, of planetary scale computation, um, that the models that it creates of an Earth system uh, are ones that uh, imply uh, the the potential application of these models as a way in which that governance begins to turn its attention away from the absorption and mediation of uh, popular voice towards, uh, and, the, and indeed, away from the biopolitical disciplining of individual persons and their profiles, and towards its attention on the material flows energy, carbon, that constitute the Earth system that make the rest of the system possible in the first place. And that shift towards what do we use the stack for? What the, the stack to come is not just a question of how we replace these layers in order so that it can do what it's doing now, but faster. This is not the, not the issue at all. It's really what, what if we take this premise that, that computation was discovered as much as it was invented, uh, that the kind of artificial planetary scale computational systems that we're developing, the ways it becomes a mechanism for how the planet comes to know itself, of which climate change is a key example, 
um, then the purpose to which it should be served is central, really, to the question of what kind of um, what kind of governance do we need? And I think part of what we're looking at is also, it's not that we don't have the technical means to deal with, with ecological collapse, climate change mitigation. It's not that we don't have the policy tools. It's not that we don't have um, the, the means. We don't have the means of enforcement. We don't have we don't have a mechanism that will actually indicate that this is the path that this means to steer upon uh, at the exclusion of other self-interested um, directions. And so that question of governance and planetary scale computation is the basis of certain forms of governance um, is something that we're uh, deeply interested in. Um, uh, okay, you're a HSC high school economics student working on a project regarding management strategies of Russian universities. Could you please help us get some information? Uh, sure, but uh, I think that would probably be better sent to, to Stroke or directly as well. Okay, David, thanks. I touched on the core of the core of the question. Um, so anyway, Brian, just want to give you one last, you're still there, one last chance to indicate what some of those other issues would be. Um, are there any other thoughts or questions? Any other things that I can, uh, and just ideas or anything else you'd like me to respond to while I'm here, I'm happy to do so. Uh, about the program or I suppose anything else. No? Okay. Um, Again, you have the link, the terraforming.stroka.com. Um, there's the link, the, the video introduction to the program is there, uh, the book introduction as well. Um, I think it's relatively inexpensive, it's seven bucks or something like this for the for the EPUB. Um, it's about 30,000 words, it's not super long, but pretty dense. And so you get your, you get your money's worth. Um, that's really, if you really want to go sort of deep into the thinking that has gone into the program, the best thing you can do is to go through this book in one way or another. And I think if you're, honestly, if you're serious about um, spending five months with us and to go through some of these projects, I think that um, spending a few hours and going through the book um, and uh, finding the areas of agreement or disagreement or provocation or, or however it is uh, with the work, that that would be a, that would be a, that would be a, definitely wise use of your time and I would certainly be, we'd love to hear from you about that. Um, can I rap for you? Um, I would, but there are contractual issues. I have a different, um, I have a different legal agreement with my label. Um, and they, there's been some issues with YouTube, um, with the label and YouTube in, in particular. And so anything that I do that's music related, um, uh, has to be done under different, under uh, under one of my other my other pseudonyms or other ideas, no, I'm just fucking with you. Um, no, I not a rap for you. You rap for us if you like. Um, let's see. Would you say it's also the aim of the program to address the planetary questions and scale at the individual level to a broader audience so that they can relate? Um, yeah, I, I, sure. Uh, I don't think that. I don't think the only way in which regular people who are, people who are not steeped in a in a esoteric design discourse the only way they can relate to the issue is is if they are located as the protagonist in a story, um, as if this was. I, I, I honestly I guess I give people a little bit more I give people more credit um, that they are able to sort of think about think about the systems in which they're embedded. Uh, uh, in ways other than a first person, a first person uh, point of view shot. Now, if that, that may not be what you mean, um, I think one of the and the race of the issue of the individual level that we are working with, I think one of the key issues that will end up being sort of working around a lot of this work in many cases as well is a it has to do with the a formulation and understanding of what what it means to be human, what it means to be um, Homo sapiens, uh, what the what our agency, our particular history, uh, boundaries, past, future capacities actually are, uh, is one that is 
on one hand more certain, like we actually know much more about the actual evolutionary history of our species in the last single generation um, than we did previous. The question of really at a more sort of you know scientific level of what is the peculiarity of Homo sapiens and what what the boundaries of this are and what its capacities are and why it's this way is is, is something we actually know more about which seems to have had a surprisingly little impact on how we actually think about ourselves in the world uh, on a day to, on a, in a day-to-day -day level. Uh, and I think that it, I think that it should. Um, I think that one of the, in, in, a, in a very direct sense, I think that one of the things that we are, will be exploring in the program are various paths out of more, um, let's say, uh, pathological forms of anthropocentrism uh, at a species level, but also perhaps at, a, at an individual at, at an individual level, um, as predic as as forms of thinking and way of thinking and knowing and acting that are based on what really amounts to superstitious concepts. Um, that may be, you know, nevertheless embedded within our uh, 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 our modernity, uh, and that the that the real uh, ethics, I suppose, of um, a a a a de a, a de westernized version of the, of of modernity, a real actual universal cosmopolitan would be cosmopolitanism would be one in which the ethics of disillusionment disenchantment of those superstitions uh, as a as a as a pursuit in and of itself uh, would continue uh, would be it would be advanced and accelerated and I think that's that so I, I think the question of the level of the individual comes back to that the level of the individual itself is something that we want to put in question that we want to ask ask the question and to ask the question ask the question about this in different ways, um, and the sense of self, the sense of individual, the sense of agency, subjectivity, and gesture, um, performativity, that may expressivity that may be held as kind of the the uh, um, uh, essential capacities and 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 values of of individuals is something that we want to. Um, to question uh, and to ask as part of this part of this issue. I think, so, I think that's the way we're sort of looking at it. But again, I think I give people a lot of credit. I think you know, I think a lot of our work is, you know, I've shown our work to all kinds of different people. People get different things out of it. People see themselves in it in different ways. Um, but um, I think we would be doing the work a disservice if we tried to um, if we tried to undermine the implications of the work in order to um, make, in order to, uh, by denying people the opportunity to actually sort of change the way they're thinking about what the work is about by transforming the work so that it just describes itself in relation to what they were already thinking. I don't think it's, I don't think it's the way to go. Um, Let's see. Consumed by accompanied by spouses during the course. Um, it, it's up to you. Uh, they're certainly welcome to move to Moscow with you. Um, they they would in order to be participants in the course, they would have to be um, they would have to be accepted to the course. But um, you know, everyone comes and moves to Moscow and lives in Moscow. In many cases, the researchers live together. Um, and if you if there's anyone you want to move to Moscow with for the period of the five months. It's completely, uh, that's of course up to you. Um, and they can be part of our community, but um, in terms of being full participant in the program, they would have to, they would have to, uh, uh, they would have to apply. Um, in a sentence, determining the transcendental conditions of planetary artificial social metabolism and stack systems, and then designing from and for that ground. Uh, but this, no, I, I'm not sure I would use the word transcendental, uh, but yes, I would basically say we are interested in the design of the artificial planetarity, basically by through the recognition that 
<clears throat> the artificial planetarity is what we have already made. The terraforming is not just what's to come, it's it's essentially an, another way of thinking about what this last three or 400 years has been. And getting comfortable with the necessity of the artificial response, that the anthropogenic response to anthropogenic climate change, um, uh, that the response to anthropogenic climate change will need to be equally anthropogenic and artificial. Um, and what that artificial planetarity would look like, um, the preferred artificial planetary, not the introduction of a new artificial planetary as though the previous one is not artificial, but rather a alternative planetarity that is predicated on the understanding that um, the planetarity is always artificial. Um, are you saying metacognition in the hay chasm of the contemplation of the Plotinian one? I don't know. I don't know what that means. Um, is culture based? Sure. Um, can you please describe to us your idea of the relationship between self and God? Um, no, I don't know. There's no, I don't know what God is. Uh, I'm not sure what self is either. Um, maybe they are, um, uh, they're two dangerous illusions that depend upon one each other and evolved, uh, evolved in a kind of strange double helix with one another. They're both, they're both abstract fictions that cohere experience into something that makes it um, predictable. They're ways of assigning meaning to things. And that, that capacity of abs narrative of abstraction allowed us to do all kinds of amazing things. But at a certain point, um, we need to be disenchanted of such things. Um, is there a place for satire and the absurd at Strelka? Yes. Could you please describe how you are directly in the program, on the ground and at the table? Thanks. Yes. Um, I am there. The So I come, the, the, as I said, the, the faculty is sort of coming in through and as well. There's some overlap between the faculty. Uh, I'm there three times. Uh, I'm there for the first uh, week or so, uh, super, uh, we, all day for the sort of first week, and then the rest of the theory um, faculty come in as well. Um, I come in the middle again uh, for the uh, that workshop around space and all of this stuff with Ellie and Ellie and Lisa Masseri and Stan Robinson uh, phoning in. Uh, and then I will be going on the, the research trip to Cambridge with you. And so that's another two weeks there as well. And then I'm basically there for the last month um, when we're putting the, putting the actual projects together um, and working with all of the groups on the ground for that last entire month, doing reviews and crits and everything, basically every day um, for all of June uh, ar around this as well. And so um, I think all adding up, I'm, I'm with you about a third of the program um, if you add up the days uh, around as well. And so you get a lot of my perspective and a lot of my voice um, and a lot of my way of framing things, but you also get you get a lot of other people as well. There's it's um, You'll have a lot of uh, voices coming from a lot of different directions. Um, let's see. Okay, so Brian, just you describe it? Just show you openness to the challenge within the program. Yep, open to challenge. Uh, but I'm open to, I'm, I think the more important things is challenging to the ways in which we should really be thinking about this common set of questions and issues that we, um, that we've sort of agreed upon are the, of the things that we need to be working on and we need to be working on them in, in relationship to a kind of regular direction. Um, uh, but what that means and how we get there and, and what the priorities are is really quite open. Um, I'm still reading the stack, and it only seem to be tr trust in the idea that computation, automation, surveillance is what has enabled us to come up with the concept of climate change, and thus they are tools we need to further design in order to get out of the climate crisis. Uh, yes, but it's not. It's it's. It, I don't. I don't. The idea is meant to be sort of reductive of this. Um, I, I suppose you could call climate science surveillance science. I'm not sure why. What that would really by what that would really mean for us as well. I, I think the term surveillance is probably one that's overly, it's um, probably overly uh, 
uh, overused to mean um, at this point almost any kind of mechanism by which something in the world is art artificially sensing something else in the world and generally and modeling data around it one way or another. Um, I think that by cohering and, and, and understanding all of this phenomenon essentially as a form of surveillance, surveillance is essentially as a form of panoptic control and therefore sensing and data modeling as essentially panoptic control forecloses everything good we would ever want to do with planetary scale computation, uh, including um, the basis by which we understand even what's going on around us and how will we act we act back upon it. Um, so I, I'm not necessarily I would call climate science surveillance science. I'm sort of using at a certain point by saying is that if we extend surveillance this far, we end up with like we end up with kind of bizarre concepts like that. And they've been working around this as well. Um, sometimes I wonder if the concept of climate change is what disproves the models that brought forth the technology that constitutes climate change. Yes, I think so in ways in in in, in interesting kinds of ways. Um, the, con the technology that constitutes climate change. Uh, yes, I mean, this is, these are kind of the contradictions I think that we're kind of sort of work, working within um, here as well. Um, the, so the clear, there's a book, there's an essay I wrote, um, here, I'll, I'm gonna, since I can't post anything in here as well, called On Anthropolysis, um, that deals with this, exact issue, I think, uh, sort of directly, pretty much what I'm looking at is the relationship between um, deep time and geology and the digging for oil uh, and the relationship between how it is that we, the geological science that allowed us to sort of understand the age of the earth and the depth and the deep time really comes from this project of digging for coal in the in the middle of the 19 in the, in the 19th century um, and so we have this strange uh, this strange effect by which um, the technology the, the, the technical pursuit of the coal which we set on fire which causes the climate change was the means by which we arrived at the scientific, conceptual, and I would say even philosophical understanding of planetary temporality. And so part of the question I think to ask is then in doing so, part of what I think to your point that we, what was disclosed was the folly of this digging in the first place. And I mean, the bigger question we want to ask is are there ways in which these kinds of Copernican ruptures could occur that are not directly pathological and directly destructive to to the what to, to the what it is that they discover and what it is that they find out and in, in one way in one way or another um and so the uh the issue i think just sort of we can wrap this up here as well but I, the real issue is 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 i'm making the argument about the necessity for a the necessity for the application of planetary scale computation is something very different than what it's being used for now, which is the over-individuation of its subject, the identification of individual humans and the profiling them, and the the uh, amplification of their voice and will uh, through advertising, through any, any of the other kinds of things, um, and to towards its application of something of a more secular, a secular form of, of planetary economics and simply pointing to climate science and the ways in which the idea of climate si climate change emerges and has emerged as a epistemological accomplishment of planetary scale computation. It is a conceptual model that emerges from this, 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 this structure um, of, of this uh, sensing, modeling, and calculating infrastructure demonstrates, I think quite obviously, that the other vector is possible. That there are other things that we can use this for that are quite productive, and that we should follow this. We should follow this direction. So, as things like the Green New Deal, where 2030 deadline appears again and again, that the introduction of that the purpose that the thing that governance should be looking at is the proper uh, reorganization of an economy in relationship to the implications of Earth's of, of relationship of planetary models of Earth systems. 
this is uh, this is is this is a, a fundamental shift. I think that we're uh, that is worth uh, that is worth worth attention to in one way or another. So it, it's not at all, I think, sim a simple argument of turning a knob of more or less technology. Uh, quite 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 different than that as well. So, but anyway, thank you for clarifying your your point. Um, yeah, and by all means, send it to me in an email. I'm not e I'm easy to find online. Okay, um, Vlad is, is uh, thankfully uh, indicating to me how long we've been online. It's been certainly my pleasure to spend so much time with you. Um, I'm, I'm apologize for the, the audio glitch in, at the beginning, but I think once we once we made it to the Q and A section, I think we got we got good good going. I look forward to um, to seeing your applications and to um, hopefully meeting some of you on interview as well, um, and to and staying in touch and to following the program as well. So um, thank you for spending a, um, a couple hours of your morning with us uh, today uh, and already being part of this conversation um, around this as well. So um, it's certainly, um, you know, we've, we've I, I, I don't, I think it's probably, uh, it's okay to say that we've had um, quite a lot of interest in the program, um, which is really, you know, uh, uh, heartening that you kind of, you know, put a provocation out there that it seems to have um, a lot of interest and response that like, not only do, do I seem to think like this is a sort of a direction, something we should be thinking about and working on together, but that um, seems like a lot of other people do too. Um, which I think bodes well for um, bodes well for the kind of work that we'll be able to do, um, and so thanks for that. Uh, I'm going to sign off then. Um, please send any uh, other kind of detailed questions to apply uh, at strel a p p l y at strelka.com. Again, the terraforming .com will have in all the other information, um, and there's nothing else. Uh, have a have a uh, have a good day. Also, I should also indicate that um, uh, we're doing a follow-up webinar uh, with Nikolai Boisha, um, who will be uh, who again, who's the uh, uh, faculty member within the program, who is the one who stays with the cohort for the entire the entire five months, and someone with whom I have you know collaborated very closely with um, developing uh, the uh, the whole the whole uh, initiative. Um, and I'm going to ask that I can send a link. I will pop, put in, and then can you, and I'm going to ask Vlad to post the link. And he'll post a link here. And that is, uh, I think, next week. Uh, and if you're, uh, if you want to follow up, I would certainly be, uh, advise you to go through. And I think what that really is going to be focusing on is, is much more of the, the kind of, um, you know, things that we're going to be looking for in terms of portfolio design, control kind of construction, and some of the, um, some of these kinds of more nuts and bolts uh, and, and important tactical issues. Okay, so thanks everyone.